All right, so welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about the bloodiest day in Russia. So this is where Napoleon and Kuznetsov are finally meeting on the in a battlefield of Bordino near Moscow. So without further ado, let us continue. This Epic History TV video is brought to you by Magellan TV, the documentary streaming service. Of all 50 battles, the most terrible one I fought at Bordino. So this is probably going to be very bad. Russia, 1812. Napoleon invades his former ally with the largest army Europe has ever seen. But for the French Emperor, the decisive blow remains frustratingly beyond reach. Russia's resilience is unlike anything he's ever encountered. And as winter closes in, his army begins the most infamous retreat in history. September 1812. Ten weeks had passed since Napoleon invaded Russia with more than half a million men. The French Emperor wanted a quick victory over the Russians, one that would force Emperor Alexander to make peace and agree to French terms. But at Vitebsk and then Smolensk, the outnumbered Russian army had narrowly escaped his clutches. The holy city of Smolensk had been virtually destroyed. Napoleon had advanced deep into Russia, and months of marching had left his army decimated by disease and exhaustion. It was now half its original strength, and summer was nearly over. And it's, the army started at around 600,000 people. So that's over a few months, it's already down to 300,000. It's probably going to get even worse. And 470 miles. He's basically outside of Moscow, so you have to think that this is before motorization of any kind. The fastest you can go was horses. Um, and a stripped down horse at that with you wearing nothing is about as fast as humanly possible you can go at this time. So pushing 470 miles in a few months, like what the Germans would do in World War II, is extremely impressive when you think about it like that. So. But finally, 70 miles west of Moscow, near the village of Borodino, the Russians had turned to offer battle. Napoleon would have a chance to win the decisive victory that he believed would end the war. Soldiers, here is the battle you have long desired. Henceforth, victory depends on you. Napoleon proclamation to the army on the eve of battle. Now, if anybody is not studying military history, it's not been in the military, X, Y, Z, you may ask why people would want to go fight. Well, it's very simple. It's your whole job. It's kind of what you train for every single day, especially if you're an in infantry, cavalry, anybody in the combat arms probably know what I'm talking about here is if you fucking sit around for four years and you do nothing it kind of feels wasted whereas you're like you're eventually hoping that this day will come and remember there's a lot of conscripts and a lot of people volunteered for this to sign up for the army of 600,000 and they finally get to actually participate in a major battle so The Russian army, commanded by the 67-year-old, one-eyed veteran, General Kutuzov, occupied a defensive position across the two main roads leading from Smolensk to Moscow. General Barclay de Tolem... Okay, so let's take a look at this defensive position before he goes on, just from my observations. These are the two MSRs, the main supply routes. These both go to Moscow. He is set up on both roads to prevent the enemy from basically bypassing him. The, the enemy has to come down one of these roads. Our army is too big. So he has built defensive positions. As you can see here, he has a very strong right center, and the left is a little weak. Um, however, he has uh, built defenses with artillery positions on each side. And you can see that this ground on the right side is very bad if you have to attack. You have to go over a, a main stream or a river, and you're going to be fired upon the entire time. 
Uh, so it's very good ground he picked to be defensive on this side. On the left side, he, again, you see the hill down here, down the down by the flechettes, um, and he's got streams down here. Now, you could theoretically push down this road and outflank this position, but you have to go through trees, and line infantry and trees do not do very well. Uh, cavalry don't do very well, artillery don't do very well. So pushing through a forest is a very bad idea and not... It can be done, it's just going to take a long time. And at that point, he has additional reserves back here. It looks like five core cavalry that he can push to um, intercept anybody coming out here. So we've got a very strong defensive position here. You will also see that he has more cavalry in reserve, which is what you do here, or you use it for skirmishing or reconnaissance. Um, but he has chosen to use them in reserve, which is a um, valid tactic at this point. He has, again, reserves down here of infantry, and he's holding these little towns out here with basically blocking detachments, well, not blocking detachments, but um, some units to give him alert that the army is coming and also buy time so he can uh, prepare for battle uh, and shift forces around. So he's got some infantry down here, and he's got a cavalry detachment down here too, protecting his leftmost flank, and then out in the very uh, left center, he has a pretty big force, actually, of cavalry, infantry, and these wood lines. He's got more cavalry in reserve. He's got a lot of infantry. He has dug in artillery positions, cavalry, and more infantry to basically halt any blows that are coming in on his left side. Because, as I said, his left is not as strong as his right is. But this left side buys him time to shift forces or support these guys. Um, so, it's a very, very strong defensive position either way. He's also got troops in Bordino to basically stall and buy time and blow the bridges in case you need to. So, again, overall, this is a very good fucking defensive position, so. General Barclay de Tolly's first army was on the right, its front protected by the Kalansha River, steep banked, but shallow and easily forded. Prince Bagration's second army was on the left, a more open position, but reinforced by major earthworks, the Great Redoubt, and what the French nicknamed, for their shape, the flesh, the arrows. Another forward redoubt at Chevardineau was expected to delay the enemy's advance. Historians still dispute the size of the Russian army, but it's likely Kutuzov had around 121,000 men and 680 guns. At the 680 guns is actually very impressive. 121,000, not much so, but it's still a massive amount of men. Um, but the 680 guns is a lot of guns. Again, but the guns, it ranges. You could have like a two-pounder all the way to a 24-pounder, and each one of them classified as a gun, so. At Borodino. On the 5th of September, Napoleon's army began to arrive from the west. Around 130,000 men. 585 guns. Napoleon quickly saw that the Chevardineau redoubt would have to be taken before he could deploy his army, and ordered an immediate assault. So when he's talking about he has to take this redoubt to deploy his army, think from Napoleon's perspective here, okay? He has to, if he wants to deploy for battle, this is a big, like, uh, thorn in his side, is basically what I can describe that for as. Um, so, and to deploy, he's going to have to get in line formation, basically, more or less. Line formation or being able to maneuver in any way. Um, he needs to form up, but he can't really do that. He'd have to form up in like a semicircle here and then a line here. That's not a very good, not ideal. So this position needs to be taken. But once this position is taken, he can then line up his guys or start maneuvering more freely than having this basically big thorn here. On the west around 130,000 men and 585 guns. So you can see what I mean. 130,000 men is still massive. These 585 guns compared to 680 is what I'm talking about. The Russians had a lot of guns here. Napoleon quickly saw that the Chevardino redoubt would have to be taken before he could deploy his army and ordered an immediate assault. The attack was led by Compan's 5th Division of the 1st Corps supported by the Polish 5th Corps to the south. In several hours of heavy fighting, the redoubt changed hands more than once. But late that evening, the Russians finally withdrew to their main line, and the redoubt fell to the French. 
Its capture had cost them an estimated 4,000 casualties, while the Russians lost around 6,000 men. Napoleon noted how few prisoners were taken, a worrying sign of the enemy's unbroken resolve. So we need to think about this. The French took 4,000, the defenders took 6,000. That's not, that's not a good trade, especially for a forward line position like this. Ideally, the forward line position, you were supposed to make the enemy suffer as many casualties as possible, and then once the point of you start suffering casualties equal or more than the enemy, you need to pull back. Because, um, again, this line was just to buy time um, and, and be able to, to give he Kuznetsov the ability, and Bordino, not Bordino, but Gratian, uh, time to redeploy forces if they needed to. So six thousand casualties is not a good. It's not very good, um, but that can happen. Again, um, also the fact that there was almost no Russian prisoners was a worrying sign for Napoleon. That might be a worrying sign because well they are fighting outside of a major city. Moscow is not the capital. Um, I have now fully uh, learned that. Um, so St. Petersburg is the capital, but Russia is still, uh, Moscow is still a very important city to the Russians. It's always been. So they're fighting really close to one of their major cities, so they're not going to surrender, which means their morale isn't broken, which means it's going to be a very hard fight to push up um, defensive lines. Um, if, they're, if their morale was weaker, you could probably break a line and maybe get a few of them to surrender, but they're not surrendering. Both sides spent the next day preparing for battle. Marshal Davout, commanding French 1st Corps and widely considered Napoleon's most able subordinate, appealed to the Emperor to use his corps to make a wide, outflanking attack to the south. But Napoleon dismissed the idea as too risky, and instead began preparing for a massive frontal assault on the Russian defences. As I say, my man Davout, very good general, a very good field marshal actually for 1st Corps. As I said, um, previously, probably a few minutes ago now. Um, again, you could brush up this right side. It's going to take a while, and it's going to be more dangerous. Um, as he suggested, that would be a way to bypass these defenses, because, again, his the left side of the Russian army is very weak. Um, and, uh, again, as Davu, I would also suggest that we brush up this right side. Um, Napoleon is suggesting that it's too risky, and we need to do a frontal assault. Now, there may be reasons as to why this is too risky. Um, again, the Russians will know that you're coming if you're going to do a right flank hook like this. So they can deploy guys out here um, to stop you and be a very bloody battle in the forest. Um, they could launch a, an assault on your positions down here um, to, you know, stop you guys from getting reinforcements. They could also launch an assault down this uh, left side, down this MSR, and cut off any guys on the right flank and then leave them completely trapped. So again... That's what's going through Napoleon's head. What's going through Davout's head is, again, we can brush up this right side and we outflank the enemy and out, and basically outflank their defenses. Uh, pick your choice on who you think would be right in this situation, but that is the situation that is unfolding, and Napoleon is going to launch a frontal assault. I would have gone with Davout's plan, or at least tried to, and see what the enemy would have done to react, but again, Napoleon's points are still valid. could not escape the feeling that something huge and destructive was hanging over all of us. Captain von Lissing, uh, 2nd Westphalian Light Battalion. So Light Battalion, Light Infantry, more or less. Um, so yeah, uh, something, you could feel it. It's a feeling. It's You've been in combat long enough, you can be like, this. I have a gut feeling that this is not, this is not right. And that's basically what this is, your sixth sense going off. Shortly after dawn on the 7th of September, Orthodox priests paraded one of Russia's holiest icons, Our Lady of Smolensk, before the Russian army. It was a stirring sight for many devout Russian soldiers, thousands of whom would not live to see dusk. Now, this is very important. Let me explain. So, and let me see if we get a better shot. So, Eastern Orthodoxy. So, Eastern Orthodoxy comes out of the Byzantines. Now, a 
I'm not going to get into the debate whether Catholics or Eastern Orthodoxy are right. Not going there. So, Eastern Orthodoxy, they have a lot of iconoclastic pictures like this, okay? Um, or icon iconoclastic was a heresy. Anyway, the these pictures are very um, something the Catholics do not do usually, but Eastern Orthodoxy does. And it's just important to remember that basically everyone here is a religious zealot. Compared to, to our standards today, every single person here is a religious zealot. Now, this is starting to kind of wane a little bit, um, but not really. So they are all devoutly Christian, and this is going to uplift them massively. Um, and as he said, many of them would not live to see dawn of the next day. So this is very important and a massive morale booster to the Russian army that is stationed here. Um, so a lot of the defenders are probably going to fight very zealously to defend Moscow or the outskirts of Moscow. Dusk. The battle began at 6 a.m. as French batteries opened a deafening cannonade against the Russian defences. Eugène's 4th Corps advanced on Borodino village, lightly held by Jaegers of the Russian Imperial Guard. After So that is important, okay? Jaegers of the Russian Imperial Guard. Jaegers are light infantry, usually armed with a rifle or a musket of some kind, depends. Um, Russians, I believe, were armed with muskets, but I could be wrong. Maybe rifles. Doesn't really matter. They're, they're basically long-range sharpshooters, and they're very light infantry. They're able to, again, take cover, skirmish, whatever you want to do, whatever you want. The modern view is like, oh, I would just take cover. Yeah, that's what they're doing. Um, so they are defending Bordino, and when the Russian, when the, uh, ugh, wow, I said a lot. When the French are advancing, the they can start shooting them off, and then they'll start pulling back across the bridge. That's all they're meant to do is have a delaying action and harass the enemy. After clearing the village, his infantry crossed the Kalacha and advanced towards the Great Redoubt, but were driven back with heavy losses. And you can see that these Jaegers form a, um, they're not forming into lines, they're forming in front of the in front of the friendly infantry to skirmish with the enemy, crouch, reload, go prone, you know, shoot, uh, shoot at the enemy. Um, that's also their job in a mainline battle, is to skirmish in front of the main line infantry. The Russians burned the bridge across the river, but did not launch a counterattack. And Eugène was able to move cannon into the village to put flanking fire on the Great Redoubt. So again, the Sun Jaegers to burn the bridge makes sense, light infantry can do that. But as I said, they did not launch a counterattack, they did burn the bridge, but if they could maybe position guys here, they could shoot them, but yeah. The French are going to bring up guns to start hitting this redoubt up here, so. In the centre, Davout's first corps began its advance against the flesh, coming under heavy fire. While on the right, the Polish 5th Corps, ordered to take Utica, got held up in the woods and ravines. Their slow advance allowed Tushkov's 3rd Corps to send a division north to reinforce the flesh defences. As I said, moving through this terrain is very bad for infantry, cavalry, artillery, everyone going through this. So a right hook is going to take a very long time. As you can see, um, when Napoleon said that that's too risky is because they can start redeploying forces to you know, intercept you. Or, you know, in this case, um, they're moving forces from this position out here up to the main line to stall the Russians. The French. Kutuzov, at his headquarters in Gorky, took little part in the battle, leaving tactical decisions to his subordinates. Barclay and Bagration had spent most of the summer arguing furiously over strategy, but in the hour of crisis, they put their differences aside. Praise be to God. Okay, so Kuznets, this is something that rarely happens, which is fucking mind-boggling to me. So, Kuznetsov is in charge of this whole army group, but he's not taking a hands-on approach because that's not his job, okay? His job is to manage his whole theater, okay? He is going hands-off and letting his subordinate commanders actually use their initiative because, again, these guys out here have a better idea of what's going on than he would back here, right? So these local commanders are able to decide on themselves what is the best tactical position. And as I said, Barkley and Bagration um, were feuding before this, but... On, the, on this battle, they have let it go and are going to work together. Now, later in uh, World War I, <laughs> the Russians will launch 
a massive operation. Um, and it will not work because two generals in the north do decide to not um, do what they're told. And World War I goes very differently uh, because they could have been won at that point. But again, generals have feuds. These guys put it aside for this battle, which I give them credit for. They could see the main French attack was falling on the Russian centre and left. So Barclay ordered General Bagavut's 2nd Corps south to reinforce Bagration. Fighting around the... And that makes sense, right? He's deploying his... He's taking forces away from his sector because it's completely not under attack and he's reinforcing the left side. Again, generals can be a little stickly and don't want to do this. But in this case, they they put their sides differences aside and are going to help each other, which massively helped their odds here. The earthworks, only to be driven out by a fighting around the flesh intensified as the French captured one of the earthworks, only to be driven out by a Russian counterattack. Davout himself was injured in the fighting as he fell from his dying horse, but he refused to leave the field. Now that is a mark of a good, usually a good commander is you don't want to leave the field even if you are injured because if you leave then shit can happen that's not under your command. When Russian cavalry counterattacked, Marshal Murat himself led the French cavalry forward to meet them. Ney's third corps now joined the attack on the flesh. A charge by Russian cuirassiers forced Murat to take shelter in a square of Württemberg infantry. Murat, with his flamboyant dress and reckless courage, had now even made a name for himself among the Russians. The Cossacks, in particular, saw him as a kindred spirit and were eager to capture him alive if they could. This is as respect from the Cossacks. Again, he had to go hide in an infantry square because of the Russian cuirassiers. The cuirassiers um, basically are very heavy cavalry. They are the ones; they're the guys that still wear breastplates for the most part. They are very heavy cavalry. Now, usually they have sabers or swords, not lances. We'll get into the definition of why that was the case, but that's what they had. So again, some of the best cavalry Russia has is coming after him. To the south, Polish troops now took Utitsa, which the Russians set ablaze before withdrawing. But General Bagavut's reinforcements arrived just in time to shore up the Russian flank. Around. So now you can see that they have near equal forces down here, and usually if you want to attack, you have around double. Um, so again, this is a, again, shifting forces down, um, buys time and strengthens this left flank. So now the, the main attack is still has to be fought over this position. At 10 a.m., Eugène launched another attack on the Great Redoubt. It was briefly captured by Morin's 1st Division, before his men were thrown out by a ferocious Russian counterattack. The Russian army's 27-year-old artillery commander, General Kutesov, was killed leading one of these counterattacks. A heroic death, but a blow to the organization of Russian artillery for the rest of the day. 27 years old for a general is really insane, but this is an insane time, it's also war time. Um, but as he said, he died. And that's going to mess up Russian, because again, when you start cutting the main heads off of like the artillery detachments, um, off the infantry guys, off the whatever, you're going to start losing cohesion and basically what the hell is going on. So it is bad that he's died. Fighting continued to rage around the flesh earthworks. Some counted as many as six major French assaults involving 45,000 troops with hundreds of cannon on both sides, pouring fire into the packed ranks. More than once, French infantry fought their way into one of the Russian positions, only to be driven out again at bayonet point. So it's a very, very heavy fighting over these redoubts, and you can see why. The French want to take them because once they have this position, they can I mean, basically sweep up the Russians um, on, the, on, their, uh, on the Russians' left, but... So the Russians don't want that to happen, so they're fighting very hard to hold his position. 
Um, and it is technically easier for them because they have guys on the hill to reinforce positions that are being assaulted. Um, again, they don't want to lose this position either. Juno's Westphalian Corps was sent forward in support, helping to clear Russian skirmishers from the woods to the south. General Bagration was close to the action, overseeing the defence of the flesh, leading forward reinforcements and ordering counterattacks. Around 10am, he was hit in the leg by shell fragments. Mortally wounded, he was carried from the field. Mortally wounded means you will die. If you ever say mortally wounded, that means basically you are di dead. Now, that doesn't mean you die immediately, but that means you will die. Um, and shell fragments probably means an exploding shell, which means he hit his main artery in his leg and he's going to die. Now, as I said, this core down here is pushing out Russian skirmishers, and the skirmishers are doing their best to delay the French advance down here, using cover, concealment, what do we have, um, to delay this core from basically flanking the position. Shaken by the loss of their iconic commander, the exhausted Russian infantry began to fall back. The French finally took the flesh. And this is going to be very important, really up till World War I, I would say, um, when big commanders like this get killed, shit goes downhill south. Shit goes, it starts going bad real fast. Um, when you lose a commander like this, especially during this time period, you lose all of your command and control and you lose the um, morale support that they offered to everyone. Again, um, if you saw your general leading guys and then um, it's very encouraging for you knowing that he's about as under fire as you are, but he's still out there, and if he gets hit... It's, it's bad on you, too, so. That's what I will say. Reckless commanders during this time are not exactly... They are beneficial in cases when you need a storm position like this, but if they die, it goes downhill very fast. Especially because Bagration is one of the um, army commanders in this. It's very bad that he got hit. Marshal Murat then led forward Freon's division, First Corps' last reserve, supported by waves of heavy cavalry on both flanks. So now that the Russians have poured out of falling back, the French are sending everyone they have, even the reserves out here, to basically take to make sure the position is actually held. Russian grenadiers formed squares to ward off the French cuirassiers, while their own guard cavalry fought the French in a giant, confused melee, with heavy losses on both sides. The Russians resisted doggedly, but the combined onslaught of French artillery, cavalry, and infantry proved irresistible. As the Russians pulled back, Friant's infantry fought their way into the village of Simeonovskia. The Russian centre was in disarray and seemed close to breaking. Surely now was the time for Napoleon to deliver the knockout blow. I would think so too. Because now you have to, the center's almost broken. If you can break the center of the enemy, you can cut them off in two, and they have to either pull back or get completely wiped out. Um, that's why this position was so vital that they be held, because now they can launch an attack on the left side, bypass all these defenses, and wrap up the left side. Um, and then these, the second corps down here, the Russians either got to pull out um, and fall back to the center, or just pull, just withdraw from the battle completely. They, they can no longer. Their positions are untenable. They can no longer hold the position. So this is the time, if you're going to do anything, to send in the Imperial Guard, the 2nd Cavalry Corps, send everyone to break the center um, and wrap up, wrap up this left with all of your forces. Soldiers, face to the enemy. Let's go and get killed. French Colonel to his men at boarding down. Now that may seem um, morbid. But that's actually encouragement, I uh, will tell you. For most of the day, Napoleon remained at his headquarters near Shevardino. Those around him later said that illness, as well as the exertions of the long campaign, had left him tired and irritable. As the Russian centre buckled, Murat and his staff urged him to send forward his last reserve, the Imperial Guard. Napoleon is not like sending his Superior Guard to do anything. Um, they are very valuable soldiers. Um, and as Marshal Murat suggested that they, if they want to finish this battle, they need, the, the, they, need the, they need this reserve. 
to punch through um, and break the center. Which I would I would agree with Mira there that they do need to do that. Napoleon is probably thinking um, he can't afford to lose these guys for a battle that may have come later past this point. So The Emperor refused. If there is another battle tomorrow, he asked them, where is my army? But he did make one exception. Barclay was continuing to move troops from his unengaged right wing to bolster the centre. As Osterman Tolstoy's 4th Corps arrived behind the Russian centre, French observers feared they were massing for an attack. So Napoleon ordered forward General Sorbier's guard artillery. His batteries opened a devastating fire on the enemy. Yet even as they were mown down in their ranks, the Russian infantry stood their ground. Oh. Um, and you can see why Napoleon would be apprehensive, because the battle after this, I mean, he suffered incredible casualties either way, and he wants to keep his this reserve for another battle that might come after this in case he doesn't want to break. Again, Napoleon is going to... By 1812, he's, he's lost, I will say this. By 1812, he, he's really starting to lose his edge here. He is not the same man as he was in 1796 or even 1805. He is not the same um, brilliant and reckless tactician and uh, field marshal that he once was. Younger Napoleon would have sent the guard here, broke the center, and wrapped up the Russian left. Older Napoleon is not going to do that. Now, this is going to, again, this is going to keep coming up, especially battles after this, 1813, 1814, 1815. He's going to become way more cautious than this. You think he's cautious now? He's going to become very cautious. So, On the Russian right wing, all remained quiet. So General Platov, commander of the Don Cossacks, proposed that he lead an attack on the lightly defended Borodino village. Permission received, Generals Platov and Uvarov led a force of 8,000 Cossacks and cavalry across the Kalacha River. Now, this is something called the enemy always has like a vote in battle, okay? Napoleon has been sitting on his ass. Um, I'm just going to say, he's been sitting on his ass. He hasn't really been doing anything to break this center. He's moved up some artillery that are mowing some uh, Russian infantry guys down. They're not going to break because this is their homeland fighting outside their major capital. They have high morale here. Now, it also stops the counterattack that may have been forming up. He didn't break the center, so the Russians are like, okay, well, we need to do something. That something is, as they suggested, they're going to rush guys over here and attack Bordino with the Don Cossack cavalry. The, the French left most flank is basically defended by a few cavalry guys that are outnumbered, and this could break Bordino and break the offensive here, or at least it could buy time for the Russians. Cossacks and cavalry across the Kalacha River. They fell on French and Italian troops around Borodino with complete surprise, spreading panic and disorder. Grouchy's 3rd Cavalry Corps had to be pulled back across the river to drive off the Russians. Russian commanders saw this raid as a missed opportunity but it had delayed the next French attack by two hours, and may have persuaded Napoleon that he was right to hold back his reserve. And as you suggested, either way, it's delaying the French, and it, it does actually get into Napoleon's head that he was right in his decision to not send his uh, reserves forward. Because again, if they didn't do this, he might have been persuaded to actually send his reserve forward to break the center. But because this surprise attack happened on his left, he wants to keep his reserve in his mind because another attack like this could happen and he would need to send his reserves to deal with it. <laughs> I have never seen such carnage. General Rapp, Napoleon's aide de camp, so basically uh, his assistant in secretary work and stuff like that, wounded for the 22nd time I've born in. Now this man so in the American terms, that means he'd have 22 Purple Hearts, which is uh, kind of insane. Around 3 p.m., the French launched their biggest assault yet on the Great Redoubt. Russian gunners targeted the French infantry advancing to their front, allowing French cavalry to outflank the Redoubt 
and charge it from the rear. Saxon cavalry were first in, cutting down Russian infantry and gunners almost to the last man. It was an astonishing feat by the horsemen, against all the rules of war, and testament to the ferocity of the fighting. As Eugène's infantry... It probably means the Russians tried to surrender and they weren't taking any prisoners. Um, but as I said, the, the, the Russians were focused on the infantry and the cavalry came in and swept up their rear and that's it. Um, cavalry getting behind anybody in this time, even in World War I, um, it's over. It, it doesn't matter, it's over. Um, they got surprised, that's it. The consolidated their hold on the redoubt. He ordered forward all the available cavalry to exploit this success. As you can see, they start forming squares to protect, protect themselves against cavalry. If you start sending your infantry forward at this point, they have no choice. Either, they either die by cavalry or they die by the infantry. But they were met and checked by the last Russian cavalry reserves. Eugène now implored Napoleon to commit the Imperial Guard. But, I... but again, yeah, again, uh, Eugène's like, we need the Imperial Guard now on this, on this thing because we can break through. Um, this is the second time that they have said that they, they need the reserve and they can break through. Napoleon's probably going to deny it because, again, this cavalry attack in his mind can still happen again. Three more reserves. Um, he's apprehensive. You know, all, all X, Y, and Z. Again, the Emperor refused. I will not destroy my guard, he told his staff. I am 800 leagues from France and I will not risk my last reserve. That is a valid point. This is his last reserve. There is no one. If, if he commits this reserve wrong and the Russians roll up his left side, he has he has literally no one left. So, again, Napoleon is not... I'm not saying Napoleon is wrong. Um, well, at this point, he may not be wrong. When the first breakthrough could have happened, I would have said he is wrong. But you can see his mindset on why he's not sending for his reserve. He has no more troops that are going to be coming from France. This is it. These are his best troops. These are most, his most experienced. He may need them for another battle after this um, that these commanders are not seeing. Because, again, these commanders out here want to win this battle. What comes next is not really on their mind. It is on his mind. By 5 p.m., both armies were in a state of utter exhaustion. The battlefield was strewn with dead and wounded. Some infantry battalions could muster only a third of their strength. Cavalry could advance no faster than a trot. Gun crews were collapsing with fatigue. As dusk approached, fighting slowly died out across the battlefield. The MSP absolutely exhausted. They've been fighting the entire day and the day before that too. Napoleon and the French army expected the fighting to resume the next day. But by dawn, Kutuzov, having learned the full, horrifying scale of Russian losses, had ordered a withdrawal. The losses on both sides were enormous. Russian casualties are estimated at 44,000. French losses around 30,000. Hmm. Usually you would see the opposite numbers on the, the attackers would suffer more than the defenders. But experience, more lie, there's a whole bunch of factors that come in, but that's not good. And you can see why Kuznetsov would be like, yeah, it's time to pull out. He started with around 120,000 men. A good third of his army is now casualties. Yeah. Including 49 generals. 12 of them killed. Now that is important too, because his, his, his command and control is gone. 44 generals wounded or that are casualties, 12 are dead. Um, that means they're out of action. That means whatever experience they had is no longer there. Any of their skills are no longer there. So again, uh, the top brass has been decimated along again with their entire Russian army really. Borodino would prove to be the bloodiest single day of the Napoleonic Wars. The Russian army could not fight another battle until it had received major reinforcements. And so Kutuzov decided that he must abandon Moscow. 
On the 15th of September, a week after his victory at Borodino, Napoleon entered the city. As you can see, he needs to get reinforcements. A third of his army is gone, and he has no choice but to basically uh, leave Moscow if he wants to keep his army intact. Victory at Borodino, Napoleon entered the city. He would find it virtually deserted, and already the first fires starting to burn. And yeah, this will end it there. The Great Fire of Moscow is what's probably going to be next in Napoleon's retreat from um, Moscow. So, hope you guys like my reaction. Uh, if you like this type of content, please uh, press the like button and subscribe for more content. Otherwise, up there will be the playlist. Um, for all of Napoleons, in case you want to go check out more of my reactions there. So, other than that, uh, you have a good day, and I will see you people next time.